Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. In this episode, I talk to Amanda Knox about her wrongful conviction for the murder of Meredith Kircher. Her experience revealed dark truths about the media's inclination to over-sensationalize stories about young women and the glaring human errors in the criminal justice system. We also touch on the topics of trauma, cancel culture, cognitive biases, law, and forensic science. Throughout this episode, I try my best to show the audience the real Amanda Knox, not the version of her that the media has depicted. Along those lines, I give her some of my psychological tests to take, including my test on self-actualization, as well as my psychopath test. You won't want to miss the results or this episode. It's a really powerful episode, and I think you'll get a lot out of it. So let's get right into it. I bring you Amanda Knox. Amanda, how are you doing today? Thanks for being on my podcast. I'm doing great. I'm a little sleep deprived, so you'll have to excuse my sleep deprived brain, but I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's my pleasure. Well, does it have anything to do with the fact that you just had a new baby girl? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> we we were <laughs> awake yes, last night for a little bit together, just wandering mm. around the house until she fell asleep again. So that's that's my world right now. Well, congratulations. Thank you to the birth of Eureka Muse Knox Robinson. Yeah, Congratulations. Thank you. You know, you there's a specific reason why you decided to tell the story of and kind of uh, to lead people on the journey, you know, tell people about your journey, right? You wanted to kind of control the narrative in a way, is that right? Yeah, I mean, so yes, the the issue that I faced from the second I got pregnant was the idea that my pregnancy and the birth of my child would, like every other private aspect of my life, be deemed in the public interest and therefore not protected by privacy laws, and that the tabloids would exploit those very intimate parts of my life uh, to defame me and harm me psychologically. (laughs) So I decided that I would try to disincentivize their their coverage and the... um, and their sort of impulse to go after me with paparazzi by, Mm. first of all, keeping the pregnancy journey and the birth journey to myself until I was ready to tell it and to tell it in my own way um, so that at the very least, when people did first hear of my daughter's existence, it would be in the context of something that was exploring these, these difficult positions that I'm in and that I'm and the sort of position that I hope my daughter will be in in the future, which is to not be treated just like the latest scandal content for in the Amanda Knox saga, as mm. Tom McCarthy so aptly put it. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So I'm a scientist here and uh, in preparation, and I really do extensive preparation for all my guests. Mm. And uh, you were certainly included in that. And what just boggled my mind uh, were, were some of the things that people would just say online with no factual support whatsoever mm. to it. And not only that, but there are various things I really, because I really got, I got like really into the case in like a really scientific mm. way. Like, like you know, the best with way. just no part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No cart in the horse sort of way. Mm-hmm. You know, I was like, what is the evidence? Just, and I would really, and I and I would wake up in the middle of the night, actually, uh, at one point, I was like, oh, what about this? And I would go and I would do extensive <laughs> Google search. I was like, oh, okay, that, 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 that answers that for me. Yeah, yeah, okay, I get it. But then I would still see things propagated over and over again. How do you have so much grace in handling that? Because oh. I noticed you don't even respond to something. Like, I wanted to fight for you. Yeah. <laughs> Some people respond on my own Twitter page. I wanted to be like, like, are you serious? Like, you didn't even look at this, like, objectively whatsoever. Yeah. yeah, it's a good question because I feel like you have the same impulse as my husband. My husband <laughs> is very, very um, protective of me and deeply, mm-hmm. deeply offended when any, whenever anyone makes a false claim about me um, online and, and vilifies me. And he's just like so outraged by it. He's like, of all the people in the world, why you? Like, of all the people. And my relationship with it is a little bit different um, in part because I spent so long not being able to defend myself at all. I was in prison for four years 
between the ages of 20 mm. and 24 when this was first happening. And I had very, very little opportunity to defend myself at all. So I wonder if, in part, I um, internalized um, some feelings of helplessness or hopelessness. Um, I also feel like the the sort of mental state that I was in in that time period was one in which I realized that, oh, wow, for so many people, the truth doesn't actually matter. Just the story matters and the characters of that story matter, whether or not they correspond with reality. And the story that I was telling myself about my own life, like what I could expect from life, like go to school, find love, have children, have a career, like those were all things that were also stories that I had been telling myself. And there had been no guarantee that that was actually going to be the course of my life. And so in the prison environment, I very much suddenly realized that there were no guarantees in life. And I had to instead be very present with what I did have, be very like aware of what I did have. And I didn't have much, so I could catalog it. <laughs> um, and then since coming home, it's a little bit different because um, the the prison and trial experience is one in which absolutely what people are saying about me out in the world very, very much impacts my right to live as a free human being in the world. But once I was exonerated, um, I realized that the the game had changed. It was no longer about my freedom. It was about my identity. And that was the thing that remained uh, the missing piece of my life that had been stolen from me. But like my freedom and my identity are two very different things. I can live with myself and my identity in my small world and also understand that like I don't actually have full control over my identity in the greater world. That doesn't like it does impact me, but it's not the same as someone trying to put me in jail. So I guess it put that into perspective. Yeah, it sounds like you became a uh, got a PhD in psychology informally throughout this whole right? process. Right, actually, a lot of psychologists <laughs> say that to me, where they're like, "Wow, some yeah. of the strategies that you used to get through that experience are strategies that we try to like." Like therapists will share. Like one of the strategies that I had, um, which I I wouldn't even consider a strategy. I sort of intuitively did it. Um, was I had conversations with my younger self about what she was going to experience in the future. So. So in a way, I was sort of big sister coaching myself through the experience um, in order to feel like less powerless over it. Like, and so it sort of like took a thing that felt very much on top of me and I put it in front of me and I sort of disassociated from it a little bit. And that helped me at, at the very least get through the day. But see, that's textbook. So, for instance, George Bonanno, but you didn't know it, that's textbook psychology. You just devised it. But George Bonanno, who was recently on my podcast, I actually highly recommend listening to to our chat. Uh, he just wrote a book called The End of Trauma. Mm. Um, he It's all about his – he's one of the leading researchers on resiliency. Mm. And he's really shown that self-talk is a major, major strategy. He has a whole chapter on self-talk in his book. Mm. So that's really cool for you to hear that. He was just – He's like just two episodes ago or something. Can so. you describe to um, me what he means yeah. by self-talk? Because I'd be curious to know if it has to do with um, the narrative of one's life that one either feels they have control over or they don't have control over. I'd be interested to know that. I think he's more referring to it in the extent to which you tell yourself that you – have deep reservoirs of resiliency mm. that are untapped, that you can handle this. Mm. You know, saying just even saying words to yourself. You know, researchers have looked at the difference between just saying to yourself, I can do this. You know what? I've faced hard things before. Um, you know, there will be a future versus thinking to yourself, this is it. <laughs> you know, like yeah. there's no hope. You know, there's a sig very, very strong statistically significant difference between those two conditions. Interesting. Yeah, I think that that's um... – I think that, that that squares with my own experience because I even would think to myself at certain times, um, I, I went through a soccer training a lot when I was a kid. And one of the things that I told myself mm -hmm. to get through the very difficult soccer, soccer practices occasionally was I would just do the little engine that could mantra over and over my head. I think I can. I think I can. Mm -hmm. I think I can. And the thing I really <laughs> loved about that was the uncertainty. I was like, I think I can. I'm not sure, but I'm going to try. <laughs> I'm going to try to get through this day. We'll see. <laughs> I love that. <laughs>
<laughs> well, by the way, that's where you got the nickname Foxy Knox. You probably never want to hear that nickname ever again. Oh. But just for the record, for the re- I, this is helpful for you. For the record, you got that nickname because what you kind of like you played soccer like a fox, like you were like yeah. So I, were good, I mean, were good? I was yeah. so I was the, one of the smaller players, and I was very quick, mm. and I was um, I played this. Um, position called top of the diamond, which is the um, the first line of defense. And it's a position where you're constantly squirreling around or um, to try to steal the ball away from people. So in that way, I and my name rhymes with Fox. So that's how that came about. Um, I want a cool nickname, right? <laughs> I want a better one. I want a better one than what they called me around your age. When I was that age, they called me Scotty Potty. Oh, no. Is so there an incident or was it just because it rhymed? No. Okay, no, no. I, well, I'll tell you. There, uh, so around, I'm a little bit older than you, mm-hmm. Amanda, but not that, by that much. Not by that much. But um, there was something called the Sour Patch Kids uh, cards, cards back in the day. Have you ever heard of the Sour Patch Kids? I mean, I, these, I've, these eaten, cards I've eaten many a Sour Patch Kid, but I did not know that they came with cards. I believe they were, they had cards and one of them, one of the names of one of them was Scotty Potty. Oh. So. That was one of the Sour Patch Kids. I'm pretty sure. Uh, maybe I'm messing up my 80s references. It was called something else, but there were these cards, and then there were a whole collection of huh. these funny things. But anyway, oh wait, th- are you th- thinking? Are you thinking of yeah. the Garbage Pail Kids? Yes, I think oh, Garbage Pail okay, Kids. Okay, okay, okay. I was about to say, I think Sour Patch yes. Kids just came in like that's a candy. Yeah. <laughs> that's a candy. You're right. You're right. Garbage Pail Kids. Well, see you. Okay, thank you. So you know what I'm talking okay. about. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Now, now I've been trying to change that narrative uh, as an adult. Uh, I had a girlfriend uh, who, who, out of her own volition, called me um, uh, Scotty Too Haughty. And I was like, okay, okay, I like that one better. That I love that one, too, because it's not even Scotty Haughty. Like, she took it to the next level, right. like MC Hammered too it. Haughty, it was yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. She was a great girlfriend, I just want to say for the record. <laughs> I appreciate her very much. So here's a quote I found um, uh, when I was listening to your uh, very interesting interview with Joe Rogan. I thought could set a stage for um, what we can really get into today. You said, I feel like I'm constantly trapped in a conversation with the fake version of me in people's minds that keeps getting recycled over and over again. That is, first of all, that is good writing. Oh, well. (laughs) You're obviously a good writer. Second of all, that's, (laughs) that's very powerful. That is very, very powerful. And I think a lot of us can relate. I can relate to your story, you know, just being very young, I was in special ed and uh, for an auditory disability I had, and I've, I read about this a lot and I wrote about this um, in, in, in various of my books. But, but uh, the point here is that I felt as though I was reduced uh, to how other people decide to put a label on me. And I feel like there's a connection here to probably how you felt mm. and probably still feel to a large degree mm. where you want to be able to, um, create your own identity aren't you know aren't you allowed to create your own identity and that's how i felt certainly as a co- as a child fighting my way i had actually fought my way out of special ed and then i fought my way into gifted ed and then people still saw me as the special ed kid and i was like but i'm in gifted like, ed what now. are you talking I'm about in- i'm literally taking different Does tests it ever change? <laughs> <laughs> can it ever change so this idea of um how gestalt perceptions really influence uh, deeply how we see people, not not just, you know, from a just a purely visual psychology mm. point of view, but from a human whole person point of view. It's amazing how it's like an optical illusion mm. in a way. Um, you start to get to the evidence, you start to talk to uh, the real Amanda Knox, which the, the, by the way, I'm thinking of calling today's episode, the real Amanda Knox. Um, once you start talking to the real Amanda Knox, maybe people's gestalt will flip. But the sure. point is the media control that gestalt, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, what's really interesting about your situation is these are people who had direct access to you, right? Like the the thing that failed you in your experience was the education system not really recognized. I mean, I already have like a, a whole, like my mom is a school teacher and I, and I love her and she does incredible work. And I recognize that it's very, very difficult to be a teacher in this world. But I do have a problem with the education system where it seems like everyone is churned through this system that is very, very specific and doesn't actually acknowledge the different ways that people learn and the different skill sets that people have. It feels like this conveyor belt education. And if you don't fit this very specific like role, then people treat you like you're 
lesser. It's it's very interesting. Um, and I think that maybe it's even more difficult. Um, and I have a lot of compassion for people who find themselves having their being sort of misidentified in their own communities, because these are people who you know and love and care about. And they're the people who are determining who you are that doesn't match up with your understanding of yourself and with the evidence. In my case, it was thousands and thousands of strangers who had no access to me, who were determining who I was for the sake of some kind of like morality tale that they were trying to like not only sort of determine like, you know, find us a, a, a scapegoat to pin all of their like horrible, you know, feelings about a terrible tragedy that occurred. But also they had like this, the thing about my case is that I became this sort of blank slate onto which people could make judgments about women and about sexuality. And very, very much there was like this morality tale being told about female sexuality where I was the, I was the stand in for everything that people hate and fear fear, but also are intrigued about female sexuality. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it, I, I think you wouldn't mind having your Monica Winsky moment <laughs> in a sense where, you know, where are the, why aren't uh, all the, all the Me Too feminists jumping on this? Because it, it really, you know, it, when you really look at it and you're really honest, uh, when pe people are really honest about what happened, you know, a lot of it had to do with your looks, mm -hmm. you know, would the same thing have happened um, if it was just your boyfriend at the time, Raphael, mm -hmm. you know, who was convicted. This is a real, I mean, this is a real, there is a real gender um, and sort of how we treat beautiful people in our society. Yeah. I mean, it's um, astonishing. You know, there's a story here. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. it is astonishing because on the one hand, Meredith also was a beautiful girl and she was brutally mm. murdered. And mm. no one really paid attention to the person who actually brutally raped and murdered her. Like what was interesting mm. about and there's also like a sort of tinge of racism here where the person who actually did this was a young black man who was disenfranchised and all of the all of the things. And because people at the time were like, well, obviously, he's just he just you know, there's nothing interesting about him as a criminal. What's interesting in a criminal is a female who is a part of involved in a sexually motivated, violent crime. So the media totally overlooked the facts of this case in order to pursue a scandalous, salacious story. And there are, you know, yeah. deep rooted reasons for that really deep. I mean, it, w the more we keep digging, I'm saying, you know, you start to realize, whoa, because it's not just simply a morality tale. You could easily if uh, by the way, his name was, Ru yeah, I want to say his name, Rudy Guede, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Uh, was the one who, uh, who, who, who murdered yeah. uh, Meredith Kircher. So, and he had been found uh, just a couple, even days before um, in a nursery or something um, broken and was found with a knife, yeah. you know, and it was only his fingerprints that were found in the room. Uh, where uh, where Meredith was murdered. His so DNA, these are facts. His DNA on her body. Yeah. Like, yeah, he, he yeah. was... Yeah. It's interesting because the way that the media treated him as well is also a weirdly off, where, one, mm. they sort of ignored him. And then whenever they made reference to him, at least in Italy, I'm actually not familiar with how they referenced him in the U.S. and in, um, in the U.K., but at the time, they always, always, always referred to him as Livoriano, the person from the Ivory Coast, which is really interesting because, yes, he was from the Ivory Coast, but from what I understand, he moved to Italy and lived in Italy with an Italian family from a young age. So he really was an mm. Italian. He just happened to be born in the in the Ivory Coast, but like people just really wanted to associate him as like an other. And then once they associated him as an other, they just sort of sidestepped him and didn't weren't really interested in the facts of his story, which is a young guy brought up in a family, but starts getting into trouble, trouble, starts breaking and entering, starts doing drugs, goes down this spiral of breaking and entering that results in the end with a brutal rape and murder. That story very, very much got overlooked. And it's one that's worth looking into because that stuff happens and we should try to stop that kind of stuff from happening. Anyway. 
Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Had you ever encountered him before? I hadn't seen him around because he played basketball with the guys who lived in the um, floor below mm. us. Downstairs. And so, yeah. yeah. So, like, yeah. he was around, but I don't think I even really knew his name until he was arrested. I remember, like, when I was in jail, I remember the moment I was in prison, I was watching the news, and they showed him being arrested. And they were like, you know, Rudy Gadeau blah, 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 arrested in Germany after fleeing the country. And I was like, holy shit, I recognize that guy. Yeah. That that yeah. guy? Like that basketball guy? That's the guy who did it? And then I kept thinking, oh, wow, thank goodness they found the person who did it. I'll be released now. <laughs> 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 exactly. Yeah, that's what, that's the reasonable assumption. Yeah. That's the reasonable assumption. Yeah, I watched an interview that was done with him where he said he first was attracted to you, um, and then Meredith was kind of like the the backup, Ugh, you know, sort gross. of thing. So he, I mean, I know, I know, and you know, he obviously um, he had talked to Meredith before. Do you reckon he was there that day because of Meredith, or he just thought it might have been an empty house? I and think that he probably he thought safe. it was an empty yeah. house. Um, That's what I'm thinking, too. Yeah. yeah. It was the holiday weekend. Um, it was understood that, like, I, I didn't know this, but apparently, you know, the Day of the Dead, uh, the day after Halloween is a, a very common time for Italian people to go and visit their families and spend time with their families. I, you know, I didn't know that. Um, but that was the reason why so many of my Italian roommates were gone. And... I had just happened to be spending the night over at my new, very new boyfriend's house, uh, who I knew of several days. Um, and so I think yeah. that he went in there to, because he knew the house, he had seen it before, he was looking to break and enter and get some money, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. So let's get a, a little pi a picture, a bit of a picture of Amanda Knox before this tragedy happened. Mm -hmm. So you wrote, you were a nerdy poetry and language student. <laughs> yeah. You, uh, correct me if all these things I'm saying are wrong. Uh, you're, you're, you were a non-drinker, a non-smoker. Your favorite pursuits included yoga and, quote, backpacking long distances with people I know. Um, your favorite films were Shrek and The Full Monty, <laughs> and you like The Beatles and reading Harry Potter books. Yeah. Is this all correct? <laughs> uh, yeah. The only thing that I would say is I was an occasional drinker and an occasional smoker at the time, but I was not heavy in either of those Fair. situations. But I wouldn't, I don't Fair. think I was ever a non drinker or like I, you know, I went to parties. I, I went and went, had drinks with people, but I was not like strict about. I, it wasn't out of control, nor was I strict about never having it. Well, that's what you wrote on your MySpace page probably when you were like 14. Oh, well, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, MySpace you know, was a yeah, while yeah, ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so I get this picture of uh, a young uh, child, a young um, girl who was uh, just like really curious about the world, really um, innocent in a way. There was a, I, I, I sense a sort of innocence to you, you know, a sort of like um, uh, naivety, naivety. Tevity, how do you say it? Yeah, yeah. Naivete. 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 Yeah, I I think that would be There's accurate. The um, yeah. I was I was the kind of person who really did well in school. Um, never really got into trouble. Um, was. You know, I, I worked a, a number of jobs to, like, save up money. Like, I was a, a soccer coach for a, a young girls team. And I, mm. you know, was... I was also very like romantically and sexually inexperienced. So I, I was definitely like a late bloomer kind of um, dorky musical theater, Ren Fair kind of individual. Really? Really? <laughs> yeah. You were in a musical theater? Oh, I love I musical theater. I was an theater. opera major. You were? Oh, me too. That me is too. so I was cool. a voice major at Carnegie Mellon. I, my dream was to be Javert and Les Mis. That is that amazing. Dream. I love mm. opera mm. and I don't have the voice for mm. it, but man, so much respect. Mm. Well, well, you, right. could, you could, you could have, you could <laughs> you, be trained. I think anyone can be trained, honestly. Do you ever <laughs> sing anymore? I do. I do. Awesome. Um, and I try to take lessons every now and then. Sometimes I even, re I even record something just with this microphone and, uh, and kind of karaoke music, like from yeah. stars from Les Mis in the background. Yeah. I, I posted it on my Twitter before. Oh, yeah, cool. So. Yeah. I was in choir, yeah. so I'm, it's definitely not opera, oh, right but I, I was in choir and I love doing musical theater. 
Right on, right on. You know, I uh, my, my heart really breaks in so many ways for this story, but one way is that I really can resonate with studying abroad. Mm. You know, when I was about uh, 24, 25, I went over to England, to mm. Cambridge, and I remember... I just remember that what it was like. I remember, you know, everyone like awkwardly having sex with each other, everyone drinking for the, you know, we're all away from home for the first time. There really is an innocence there. Mm. The last thing you would ever imagine, you know, people say things like, well, why wasn't she more, you know, affected, you know, outside? Why is she kissing? Look, it's not like the first thing you assume, no. you know, is in your worldview. You know, your worldview was literally, um, as psychologists call it, a seismic earthquake. That's mm. what they call it in the uh, post-traumatic growth literature, which is, um, I'm, I'm working on my next book on post-traumatic growth. So this topic is really front and center in my mind right now. And and there's a whole assumptive world theory that I think might really interest you if you yeah, want to uh, look no, at that I, literature. I, tell me more about the seismic yeah. eruption. Earthquake. earthquake yeah sorry. i mean it so, <laughs> yeah it, it's tied to this idea of assumptive world theory where we have these traumas and um i like to define trauma very broadly as anything uh, any event because who am i to say oh that counts as a trauma or that doesn't count as a trauma yeah, right like who yeah, am yeah. i to say that um it's it's in a, in a lot of ways traumas in the eye of the beholder mm. and uh, any event that causes this complete re cognitive restructuring of oh i thought the world was safe yeah. Uh, where basically your your basic assumptions of the world are violated. Yep. And this happened to you in a span of like an hour. Yes. You know? <laughs> and if people are like, oh, why didn't she act more normal? Like, like there's any normal way to act when your entire assumptive world has been violated. I really appreciate you actually saying that because it's something that I've had a, a really hard time explaining to people. Like, I did not go home that morning to take a shower knowing that I was going to come across a crime scene. And yeah. Even when it was made apparent to me that there was a crime scene, I had this like real uh, it was so surreal to me that I felt a little bit like disembodied. Like, what is mm. happening? And also, am I certain what's happening? Because everyone's yelling in Italian. Like, it was so, so bizarre that I I, I had trouble processing the experience. Um, and, you know, a lot has been made of my behavior in those days. Um, like, uh, there's that footage of Raffaele and I outside of the, the house waiting for the police to tell us to go into the police station, and he kisses me. And yeah. the amount of times that that moment of him just sort of, like, trying to do what he could which was just kind of hold yeah. me and and kiss me and tell me I'm going to be okay. Like how that was yeah. twisted and distorted in the media into like, oh, my God, she's such a sex fiend that she can't even keep her hands yeah. off him outside of a murder house. It's like, what is happening? Um, anyway, so I, yeah, that, makes, that makes a lot <laughs> of sense. <yeah. laughs> and to be clear, I mean, at that moment, that if we double click on that precise moment, it's not like you opened the door and you saw what was inside no, the door. I did not. Right? No. And I think people assume that as well. Just so many assumptions. I, I'm I'm angry in the name of science. I'm angry. At, you know. I'm also angry as the human dimension to it. But I'm saying even if you take that out, someone's like, "Don't be biased, Scott." I'll be like, "No." My my point is, there's so much evidence to contradict so many of the of the bullshit that's going around and that and I can't stand that when there's a propagation of bullshit that really bothers me. Oh gosh, yeah. It's yeah. man, how do yeah. you live with the propagation of bullshit? Like you have to take a deep it's breath. So everywhere in this world right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, I mean and the way I think about it is like okay, there is the propagation of bullshit, but why? Like why is it mm. that the bullshit resonates with people because it wouldn't be propagated if it didn't resonate with people um and mm. so that's a, a deep question that i keep asking myself like why is the idea of a a, a whorish murderer so much mm. more compelling to people than the idea of just a regular human be regular human female who didn't have anything to do with this and was very, very confused and scared in the in the days leading up to her arrest. Like, you know, I've just been thinking, is that I wonder is that there's a general phenomenon here that no one's ever really talked about in in open, honest discourse. But if you look to see what some of the most popular porn is, it's degrading beautiful women, you know? Interesting. There, it, it allow 
there's something there's something there that I I think there should be more research on. I'm not saying I know the final answer. I understand what's deep beneath it, but uh, even my uh, mentor uh, I've never met, but my mentor in the sense my intellectual hero Abraham Maslow mm-hmm. um, wrote a whole essay on. Uh, pornography in the 1560s. And by the way, I'm not anti-pornography in oh, general. No, Don't neither get me am wrong. I. No. I'm no prude, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I'm I'm just noting a psychological phenomenon that I that even Maslow noticed in the 50s and 60s. He said there's something where we elevate our self-esteem by getting back at all those women who rejected us, all those beautiful women. Who, there might be something there. Yeah, you know, I actually think that there there is something there, and I would love to look in. I want to ask my um, dominatrix friends about this. Um, <laughs> yeah, you should. Uh, yeah, because you like should. I was actually going to bring that up. Yeah, yeah. well, because yeah. it, it's interesting because it's the flip side, but that flip side only exists because I think there's that predominant like let's punish the beautiful woman and i do feel like i have myself like had to sort of get over that icky feeling that maybe one of the reasons why the police were going after me was because Mm. there was this weird sort of pornographic interest in me like i i had this like weird Mm. feeling like are they just focusing on me because Like they have weird sexual feelings towards me that they don't know how to like do. Like when they say things like, oh, I had a gut instinct that she was guilty. It's like, did you or did you have a dick Mm. instinct? Like what's going on here? Yeah. Um, No, look, absolutely. And there's another injustice here, which is a complete misrepresentation of the BDSM community. And this really upsets me. Yeah. Um, I have a whole episode in my podcast Labyrinths about this. Did you listen to it? I I listened to it. I listened to it. I wanted to bring this up. Can you tell a little bit about your experience at DomCon? Oh, was, did gosh. you have fun? I loved yeah. DomCon. So my experience with DomCon was that I um at the time I was exploring this idea like what what is up with this idea about a sex game? Like why was that so titillating to people? Mm. What even is a sex game? And also like do people who take part in sex games to like do they do they how do they feel about the way that their sort of world was represented in my case and vilified in my case and so i reached out to the the premier dominatrix ever who like came up with domcon mistress mm. cyan yeah. and what i found a legend, a legend and mm. this like mm. amazing person who survived cancer and ha- have done like so many amazing things and i reached out to her and i was just like hey so i don't know i don't know if this makes like makes me a creep or anything but i just was wondering if you could tell me more about this world and what's going on there and she was so warm mm. and so kind mm. and was like you will be like just come visit see for yourself Self, you'll be my special guest. I'll take care of you. I'll introduce you to people. And she really like just for over those days that I was there. I went to the New Orleans one, um, which was it was nicely small and sort of intimate, and everyone like there knew each other. It was really great. Um, and you know, clearly, I was like exposed to new ways of thinking about even just not just sex, but about relationships, like. My husband and I came away from that experience being like, you know what, we should have like codes of conduct and and ways of communicating outside of the bedroom to determine like, okay, in this in this world right now, um, we are going to like focus on each other and we're going to be really, really clear communicators with each other. But there are some times in life where I have to get work done and you have to be a second priority for me for this hour. And like we need to communicate that so no one's mm. feelings get hurt and no one, you know, like there's lots of ways that we miscommunicate with each other just because we're not being explicit about what Absolutely. our expectations are. And you can totally like do away with all of the hurt that can come from not being good communicators by just being more explicit about your expectations. So that was like my big takeaway. Not to mention I got and flogged did- by Mistress Cyan and that was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, hopefully there were no video cameras there. there were not. That's all you needed. Yes. Yeah, and yeah, I was yeah. really terrified about that. But again, yeah. BDSM community, like they are all about consent and they're not going to talk yeah. about your business without your consent. So good on them. Yeah. Consent and you no, know, there's care. There's yeah. care deep, deeply intertwined with it. So I gave you a battery of psychological tests to take, and you were such a good sport. Oh, they were You were fun. such a good sport in taking these tests. Yeah. So let me reveal some of these results, and we can talk about uh, about them. If you do, you agree with them? So yeah. first is your top your top three sources of self actualization are the first one is continued freshness of appreciation. How has that uh, played a role in your life? 
Um, I guess I feel lucky that um, whenever I encounter these, uh, whenever I encounter something beautiful, I'm not bored. Like, even if I see the same, even if I listen to the same song that I really love, I still really love it. And I I appreciate that I'm sort of built that way. Um, so I, I feel grateful <laughs> that I feel gratitude mm. for things. Um, and I don't take things for granted. So I think that that's a fair assessment. Oh, one thing I wanted to note um, before we go into these results is um, mm. my husband disagreed with my results in in many ways. Mm. Um, and oh, only be- can we bring him on? Can we bring him on? Yeah, sure. He's he's just outside. I can wave him down. Hey, boo, you want to come in? <laughs> <laughs> this no, I want. I want to hear what he has to yeah, say. No, yeah, no, it's yeah. He he's now. His name is Christopher. Christopher Robinson. Robinson. Right? Yeah, here I'll okay. scooch over so he can. I've been on the search for the perfect mattress for the past few years, and let me tell you, I've gone through so many mattresses. My friends have made fun of me because for so long I didn't actually own a mattress. I just went through so many free trials. I had no idea what it feels like to be well rested until I tried a Helix mattress. Are you not able to sleep because of stress and anxiety? It's definitely understandable given the current state of the world. Psychological research shows that high quality sleep is so important for stress and well-being though. Lack of quality sleep can affect your memory, increase mood swings, and even can lead to depression. While a number of factors contribute to poor sleep quality, your choice of mattress can really matter a lot. Helix Sleep makes personalized mattresses right here in America and ships them straight to your door with free, no contact delivery, free returns, and a 100 night sleep trial. To choose a mattress, Helix made a quiz that takes just two minutes to complete and matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. If you like a mattress that's really soft or firm, you sleep on your side or your back or your stomach, or you sleep really hot, with Helix, there's a specific mattress for each and everyone's unique taste. Personally, I took the quiz and I was matched with the Helix Sunset Lux because I wanted something that felt soft and I sleep mostly on my side all night. I've got to say, I love my Helix mattress. I wake up really feeling refreshed and ready to work out or start my work. Also, I've been tracking my sleep with a device and my sleep score is consistently in the good or excellent range. This is a new thing for me, so it's really exciting to finally get high quality sleep. I really do love Helix, but you don't have to take my word for it. Helix was awarded the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ, Wired Magazine, and Apartment Therapy. Just go to helixsleep.com slash psychology, take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. They have a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you probably will. Right now, Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders, and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash psychology. Get up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows at helixsleep.com slash psychology. That's helixsleep.com slash psychology. Okay, now back to the show. Do you want to listen? Here, you can have the headphones for a second. It's okay. Hey, uh, do you go by Christopher or Chris? Hello. Okay. Hi, do you go through Christopher? Do you go by Christopher? Uh, Chris or Christopher, either one. Okay, cool. Hi, I'm Scott. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Scott. So uh, Amanda says you disagreed with some of her test results. We didn't get to the dark light triad mm-hmm. stuff yet. I'm curious to see your thoughts on that. But so can you kind of hang around as we as I go through all the results with Amanda? And can you hear a dialogue between you two about it? Um, sure. Wait, Oh, I, I can't hear, but... Yeah, well, here, there, there, there's another pair of headphones. So oh, I'll just get okay. The other... <laughs> get another pair of headphones, because this is fun. We have so, the technology. Uh, Amanda, what... <laughs> What what there I said go. to him is, you know, we'll go one by one and kind of like here have a dialogue here of what okay. he thinks. Okay. So you tell me first whether or not you agree with it or not, and then I'll ask him. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so you just talked about continued freshness of appreciation. Uh, do you agree, Chris? Do you agree about the very, very high? She scored actually 100%. Yes. 100%. That I yeah. 100% yeah. agree. Yeah. yeah. And then the second one was truth seeking. Mm. Yeah. I'm kind, of a, see that? I'm kind of a stickler for that where I am, I, even to like my own um, my own chagrin or my own um, difficulties where like I understand mm. that sometimes the easiest way is to just say, you know, whatever, like 
that's true. That isn't true. It doesn't really matter. Let's just move on. Mm. And I'm kind of a stickler for mm. like, no, I want to know what's true. Like, what is really mm. going on here? And I do that because I have a sense of responsibility towards the truth that and and by that, I mean, I, I have a sense of um, I feel a sense of responsibility to humans. So mm. I, f I feel like truth seeking is a, a, a humanitarian thing for me, where if I am always, always looking for the truth, that means I'm always looking for the truth of the humanity of the subject that I'm interested in. Mm. Um, and mm. if I'm not willing to always be a stickler for the truth, that means that I may overlook the humanity of someone mm. who I'm interacting with. It's the weird moral dimension you have to truth seeking, whereas for me, it's more of a pure a, scientific pursuit sort of thing. Right? Yeah, you're like more of yeah. a, like the principle of the yeah. thing. <laughs> I mean, she scored very high on truth seeking. Yeah, no, I get that. She scored very high. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was her second highest. Um, the third one was was interesting. Authenticity. Hmm. Hmm. Authenticity. How, how does that play out? And what does authenticity even mean? What does that mean to you? Um. Well, I think this might be in part due to the fact that I have, for the majority of my adult life, been accused of being something that I'm not. And I've been mm. accused of being inauthentic and being a liar. And so it's mm. become um, like I've I think I've overcompensated on the other end of that mm. to be like, no, like, judge me all you want. Just judge me based upon the truth. And so if you're going to mm. if I'm going to give you the opportunity to judge me or anything else, like here it is mm. here. Let me lay it all out for you. Like I've got and at, that has. But also at the same time, like even when I was a kid, I wasn't like a person who like my mom tells this story about how like the one time I ever lied mm. to her about something she sort of didn't know what to do like I was like six maybe and I lied about drawing mm. um, a stick figure on the wall and mm. and like she I said she was like man did you do this and I was like no 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 and so she let it go for a half an hour and then like a half an hour later I came to her sobbing <laughs> like I did oh. it I'm sorry <laughs> well, I that's, don't know that's kind of like what happened that's kind of like what happened with you in the interrogation is you they, they pressured you so much you signed something but you felt such an overwhelming sense of this is not true that you wrote a letter if i'm right did you write a letter a note to yeah. one of the uh, head up detectives or something yeah. being like look this wasn't true yeah, yeah they and they wouldn't listen to me i i wrote that note specifically mm. because i kept saying but can i talk to you again can i talk to you again please what i said wasn't i can't i have to recant like blah 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 and they just were not interested so i asked for mm. a piece of paper to write it down yeah mm. Mm. It just made me think of that, and it seems analogous in a way. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, you're right, right to the. So the next, the next one. Look, I'm not supposed to say the fourth one because it's the top three, but the mm. fourth one is so it, it it was actually tied. Oh, is it tied? Yeah, it's literally literally tied, and that's equanimity. And I think this mm. one is very very relevant to your whole life. You have mentioned that you sort of have a stoic um, sort of sensibility. Um, People, when they said things like, oh, well, you didn't uh, act how a normal person would act if someone, you know, this equanimity aspect to you in, in a way is what helped get you through so much mm -hmm. of this, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like trying to not just letting um, my emotions take over me, but letting them be information that I process. And I don't mm -hmm. know, I've, it's interesting because I used to refer to this as like deer in headlights syndrome, <laughs> where I would just sort of like when something happened, I would just be like, huh! and I would sort of need to process this, um, all this information. But it, mm. but I think equanimity is a nicer way of saying it. <laughs> I think her self assessments on the sort of light triad oh, things are now we're going to get mostly to that. accurate, right? I think there's okay. There's a okay. bit of but let's go yeah. through them. Don't 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 okay. don't don't, don't uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> I feel like you're I feel like you're spoiler alert in this. And this is the most this is what everyone came for, the popcorn. Your psychopath score, are you ready? <laughs> dun 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 is extremely low. Extremely Darn. low. You are actually not a psychopath. <laughs> I try. You are not a psychopath, according to my test. And you actually came out, quote, strongly tipped toward the light side. 
strongly tip toward the light side um, in my light versus dark triad test. Now, for my fellow nerds out there, I took a science. These are this is a scientifically valid test. This is not just like you know, like the Meyer Briggs, <laughs> which mm-hmm. isn't scientific. But this um, this takes uh, well validated dark triad research and uh, my new construct, the light triad, and looks and and looks within her at all of these things, um, looking mixing matching to come out with an output. So the output is your strongly tipped to the light side. But let's go through each of the facets because they're super interesting. Cool. That your results. The first one is faith in humanity. This this is the one fascinates me. And you remind you so you scored very, very high in faith in humanity, which is believing in the fundamental mm. goodness of humans. Mm. And you reminded me of an Anne Frank quote, which is in spite so she wrote this in her journal as the Nazis were really coming up the stairs yeah. to kill her. She Ugh. wrote in her journal, in spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart. Yeah. Mm. So that's a direct quote from her journal. And you made me think of that. So Amanda, you still score high in faith in humanity in spite of everything. Can you kind of explain a little bit about that? How you feel about that? Mm. Um, I mean, I feel like I don't I don't have evidence to point to <laughs> necessarily. Um, I just have an intuition that everyone is doing the best they can even when they're not doing the best they can like everyone i i feel like Mm. if i put myself in the shoes of people who have made even like horrible horrible decisions and terrible mistakes the vast majority of the time i don't believe that they're sitting there cackling about how evil they're being I think that they're telling themselves a story about what they're doing, how they're doing it, how what they're doing is the right thing to do. And I think that what that means is that very often we are all making horrible mistakes and and Mm. doing, you know, perpetrating lots of harm towards each other, but we're not doing it because we want to be hurting each other, which makes me think Mm. that like there is deep down a fundamental impulse for humanitarian there is a fundamental humanitarian impulse in all of us i mean yeah the, people justify yeah the other side of that is like the moral luck question mm, which yeah. we explore was mm. that in the um one bite of the elephant episode yeah one bite yeah. of the elephant at a time yeah um do you know thomas nagel's moral luck thing? of course yeah, yeah. so yeah. you know Big fan i of mean Nagel. even the talking about the Nazis from a moment ago, like the whole question mm-hmm. of, well, if that Nazi prison guard wa- happened to be born in Argentina instead of Germany, would he have mm-hmm. become that guy? You know, mm-hmm. probably not, right? Yeah. Um, how much does do those external twists of fate determine w- what our moral path is in life? Mm-hmm. And when you take that into account, especially neither of us believe in free will is another side of this. When you get rid of oh, that's free a will, whole conversation, right? <laughs> um, then you know moral moral responsibility seems to go out the window in in one light, but in, by the other light, no one's really no one's really morally culpable because you're just the little meat robot doing what you were programmed to do, or uh, through the vicissitudes of quantum fluctuations, right? Either way. It's hard to blame people and and hate them for their actions, right? It actually leads to compassion, I think. Yeah, I hear you. I don't know if we want to open that can yeah, of worms. I had a big, four hour two part. Yeah. I did. I, I highly recommend. I wish I was listening to my two part series with Sam Harris, where mm. we vehemently disagree about. Oh, this. interesting. Yeah, I would. I <laughs> yeah, we're so going to check guys that may out. Want to listen to yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, however, I, I read something in one of your blog posts, I think, is is illustrates your own sense of compassion, um, even for Rudy mm. Guede. So you had said that what you're angry about is that he just won't admit and, and you know, save a lot of people a lot of heartache and uncertainty and um, and just, you know, that he just won't admit that he that he killed Meredith. However, you say, um, I doubt he ever will, but if the day he does, I will celebrate his rehabilitation and wish him the best on a new and honest chapter of his life. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. I thought that it kind of speaks maybe a little bit to your instincts there for not defining anyone by their their worst case, even t- even Rudy. Yeah, yeah, and I and I stand by that because I think the thing that anyone who has experienced harm most wants from the person who harmed them is an acknowledgement of the harm. Because at that point, I can say, all right, 
we at least are on the same page that what happened was shouldn't have happened and that I I have been harmed and that you are not sort of pretending that that harm doesn't exist or that what you mm. did didn't cause direct harm to me. Because when someone doesn't mm. like admit to the harm that they've caused, it makes the person who has been harmed feel, first of all, like they're being blamed for their own harm, but also it makes them feel unsafe. Like, oh, if you don't acknowledge mm. what you've done, are you going to do it again? Like, If you didn't do anything wrong, well, then who's to say whether or not you're going to do it again? And so, like, that's that's the sort of key thing for me. Like, people make mistakes and do horrible things all the time. That doesn't mean that it defines them. But what does matter from a trauma standpoint is the acknowledgement of the harm and Mm. of the action that caused the harm. Mm. Yeah, I I truly wish Rudy would do this someday. Yeah. Um, okay, so back to the, your dark triad score. So you score very, very low in psychopathy, as I already mentioned, which is callousness and cynicism. And then Machiavellianism, you score very, very low, which is strategic exploitation and deceit. You know, everyone knows the Machiavellian person. They're always scheming, mm-hmm. right? They're always like, everyone knows that person. Every time you talk to them, they're like, oh, you know, if we move that chess pawn, then uh, we right. can get this out of that person. Right. So you scored very low in that. You scored very, that's not who you are, mm-hmm. according to my test. However, yes. <laughs> however, this is the most, perhaps the most, I, I know, we've been waiting. I, I saved this one for last because I suspected this is maybe where you two disagree. Your narcissism score mm. was above average. Yeah. was above it. Now it wasn't a hundred percent. It was six, It was uh, approaching 60%, but it was a, it was, it was greater than average by 12.45% yeah. to be precise. Yeah. Now, what do you two think of that? Yeah. So I think that I because of how much my life has been like because I've been accused of things that I didn't do I potentially have become someone who has been deeply invested in my sense of self and I worry then yeah. that like has my narcissism been you know pushed up by like mm. as a sort of trauma response as a kind of like shield response to something and I do worry about that mm. now Chris <laughs> so you know, I, w- I want to hear yeah. what Chris has to say about this. Yeah. I think she's one of the most selfless, generous Aww. people I know, right? Um, yeah. And I think one of the issues with any sort of self-reported test is you have your own cognitive blind spots towards your own behavior, mm. tendencies to inflate yeah. good qualities or um, diminish bad qualities, et cetera. But also there's things like imposter syndrome. He and thinks that I have imposter syndrome. I think Amanda has a deep, oh, deep possible. case of imposter yeah. syndrome. And that I think yeah. she has a, yeah. a big difficulty seeing her her deeply positive traits, actually. Um, and if you were to look at the DMs mm-hmm. that come in, you know, of people saying, wow, you're such an inspiration to me. Like Amanda reads those and she's like, no, I'm not. Mm-hmm. You know, she doesn't oh. she doesn't believe that even though even if yeah. thousands of people are saying, wow, you're so strong and you really helped me change my life that she doesn't believe that she doesn't have that that self-belief. So the idea that she's narcissistic and thinks that she's a savior for people, it's not the Amanda I see. Um, and I'm actually yeah. what are the you you know, it's better than we do. What are the questions you do that relate to too. that score? Well, um, I can't. I certainly can't reveal that. Oh right, right. Um, that would... Because that's actually uh, the telling this. It's like saying, "Give uh, me the IQ test items." Right, and then, right, okay. Right. But there's an interesting link here between that. I'm going to send you an article I wrote in Scientific American on the link between a particular kind of narcissism and imposter syndrome. It's not the kind of narcissism that most people are aware of, but it's one that I've conducted research for the past decade about, and I've been trying to increase mm. awareness about because it's the one that's most linked to psychopathology, Ooh. and that's called vulnerable narcissism. Huh. Mm. Now, I, it makes me think now I want to give you my vulnerable narcissism <laughs> test. Yeah. But, um, uh, vulnerable narcissist. So most people, when they think of narcissism, they think of the grandiose narcissist, which is chest thumping, mm-hmm. extroverted. Um, <coughs> Trump. Okay, right. So they think <laughs> of the, you know, okay. Yeah. I mean, stereotypical, stereotypical. I'm great, right? The person that screams, I'm great. But 
Um, and uh, and this is something in my own healing process. So I th- this is a very human thing. I'm not I'm not I don't believe in separating we're narcissists from not narcissists. Mm. I think we all have narcissistic tendencies. But a lot of people who have gone through trauma develop, and we found this. We've published papers showing that mm. early childhood trauma and and violation of expectations lead to a vulnerable kind of narcissism where the person uh, feels shame all the time. Mm. But at the very so so shame is the number one marker of it. Mm-hmm. And um, and and we found uh, we were the first ones to publish a paper uh, showing the linkage to imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. So I'm actually going to send you. I'll send you that scientific. I'll make a note to send you that scientific American paper. Um, and that makes sense. Make note, like the idea I, that like you yeah. know people are saying bad things and or like doing things to you, and you think oh they're doing it because it's me and and I'm a, you know they think mm-hmm. I'm a bad person, and you're like no they're just. They're just doing their thing and it has nothing to do with you. And so you are being a little bit of a narcissist by thinking that people are being, you know, bad to you for whatever reason. Like, is I mean, that what a, you're talking about? It's like, a smoke and fire thing a bit, I think, when the whole world tells you for years on end that you're an evil monster, <laughs> right? It's. Right. I think it's hard for anybody yeah. to not go, is there anything there, you know? Or and also, but like oh, I think it's totally, totally true that I'm I'm guilty of this. Where like I I when people are like out about in the world and I notice that they recognize me, I think are they talking to me because they've heard of this horrible story about me, or are they or are yeah. they just talking to me because I'm happen to be getting mushrooms at the grocery store next to them grabbing a cucumber? Like I do worry about so, that. So I this is exactly what I help my clients with. So I feel like I'm giving uh, like do, do I slip into psychotherapy mode all of a sudden? <laughs> but um, but but can I give you some advice yeah. just just to help you with your your healing? Yeah. If I can in any way, the number one uh, point of why vulnerable narcissism, like at the root of vulnerable narcissism, is an uncertain self esteem. Mm. Okay. Uh, there's literally. Literally, there's an entire handbook called the Handbook of Uncertain Self-Esteem. Okay. It, 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 with re, there's a whole research field on this. Um, I suspect that's what you, you're plagued with. Mm. And um, and if you could find a way of grounding yourself more with uh, with self-compassion exercises. Um, I love Sharon Salzberg's loving kindness meditations. Mm. If you can just ground yourself with more of an inner presence that isn't doesn't need to be validated by others, mm. you know, um, where where you're um, you don't lead with uncertainty about your self-esteem, but you lead with who your authenticity that you always score high on. The more you can just lead with your authenticity, mm. um, the less you'll feel these vulnerable narcissistic characteristics. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. No. That's. That's actually really great, and I think that 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 does sa- that does ring very true to me. I mean, it's um, I I'm think, almost like getting sad. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah, yeah. A, a, there's hope here, but I'm saying there's hope. Yeah, a, yeah. A, yeah. a thing she's been grappling with ever since this Italy trauma has been, and it's something I think we talked about with Lavar Burton actually, mm. Um, mm. in that in that uh, season one episode of Labyrinths, that mm. Amanda worries that the most you know notable thing about her forever will be a thing that didn't that she didn't do and that happened to her and yeah it's a it's a most people don't have the opportunity to deal with uh, that strange circumstance where the whole world associates your name and your identity and what what who you are and why you matter with this thing that has nothing to do with you um and yeah. she often wonders Will I ever contribute to the world in any way that will matter more and that will have an impact more than this other thing that is not of me? And th- I think, but yeah. I have a radical, I have a radical suggestion. Please. And uh, this may sound like I've just slipped into Oprah mode, but I have a <laughs> radical, radical suggestion. Had it ever occurred to you that in this precise moment you're enough? No. Um, no. Like that's it. Yeah. I, I, I do feel like you're a truth seeker. Had, entertain that hypothesis for mm-hmm. a second. You know, like maybe this precise moment, it's like, oh, wait, I, I'm enough. Everything else is just gravy from here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I'll try that. I'll, I'll do a meditation on that today. Thanks. Awesome. Awesome. So Chris, thanks so much for, for joining us for this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have, uh, Amanda, do you have, <laughs> I appreciate that. Amanda, do you have another, do you have another 10, 15 minutes to talk about cognitive bias? Oh, sure. I want to be really yeah. respectful of your yeah, time. Yeah. I'm going to hop out and attend to baby. Oh, is she awake? Well, I'm just cool. going to check. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice to talk to you. <laughs> Thank you, Chris.
Nice talk to you too. Didn't expect it to go off in that direction, but I'm, <laughs> I'm actually glad it. I'm, I'm I'm glad it did. I'm glad it did. No, I appreciate it too. Um, because this is, I feel like yours. Mm. Are you okay? Yeah, 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 I'm okay. It's this is like an mm. ongoing conversation between me and Chris because, like, I've often been mm. um, somewhat astounded by like how confident he is in himself. Um, in the sense mm. that, like, you know. Uh, the sort of things that would get me down, he's just like, well, I I know that I'm a, a good writer and I know that I'm like a this, that or the other. So I don't have to worry about whether or not the world is acknowledging that I am or not. Um, and I struggle with that more where I feel like I have to prove myself constantly and I'm not giving myself as much space to just prove myself to myself. Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you, but... You know, a lot of healing will come from feeling whole uh, in, in inner, mm. you know, inner wise. Um, great. Well, so you've been really interested in cognitive bias. I have, and, yes. And uh, you, you learned a whole lesson. Now, you really wrote a nerdy blog post that you could probably submit <laughs> to a scientific <laughs> journal <laughs> with with this uh, this bias. And this. I mean, you gave, uh, you know, did you hear my chat with Kahneman on this podcast mm -mm. by any chance? No. Have you listened to that one yet? You know, um, he's, uh, Daniel Kahneman, obviously, uh one of the co-founders, uh, leading researchers of the cognitive bias literature, mm -hmm. but you, you had new ones that I had never seen before. <laughs> well, I've and gone so down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, you, you did. Well, I appreciate you. You're in a safe, nerdy space here. Thank so, you. <laughs> um, yeah, you're, you're, you're welcome. So you look, I thought this was really interesting. You literally coined a new bias that I think is really a good one. And it's called the single victim fallacy. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about what that is? Cause yes. I, I think it'll blow people's minds cause it's almost doesn't dawn on people that it can be multiple victims. In this yeah. Situation. Yeah. Well, I, and I think that just arises from um, these black and white narratives. But what I observed in my own experience was this false notion that if Meredith, the young woman who was raped and murdered, is a victim, hmm. then anyone else who is within the vicinity of the story cannot be a victim. And mm. similarly, like if people say, well, Amanda's a victim, like people have treated this case as if I'm not a real victim, that there's a real victim and then there is me. And I wanted to point out, like, just because Meredith was the original victim in this case doesn't mean that there couldn't be other people who are victimized from this story. Mm. And I wanted to point out this this like black and white thinking process where it's like there seems to be this sort of zero sum bias that like if there is if there's victimization on my part, that that somehow takes away from the victimization on Meredith's part. And I want to point out, like, that's absolutely right. not true. Um, but I continually have that thrown at me constantly um, by people online mm. who say, like, any time that I am asserting my victim, like the, how I have been victimized, I am somehow diminishing the victimization mm. of Meredith. And I I push back against that constantly and I and I to the point that I felt like I had to define a whole new bias <laughs> um, like about it um, and I think that that happens a lot in wrongful conviction cases where there is this tendency for people to say well because the the family of the of the original victim needs closure we cannot explore mm -hmm. the victimization of someone who has been accused yeah it, uh, there's um there's such a, a horrible paradox here um, that Saul Carson mm. or Saul Carson has pointed out, and that's that being innocent, literally just being innocent, actually can put you at increased risk of not being seen as innocent. You know, you even making this point, some British tabloids would be like, "Oh, defensive, mm -hmm. defensive Amanda." Right. So you, should, you almost can't win, right? Like, you know, you're, you're, it's like, what am I not supposed to, to defend my innocence? Yeah. You know, like I should just shut up. Yeah. You know, what what's the alternative here? You know, that I just shut up. So, um, yeah, that, that's tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you? Um, are you familiar? I, I'm. I'm. I. Do you know Saul Casson? Because I. I know him personally. I um. And it, he reached out to you when you were in jail. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And he's he said, a really great yeah. guy. Um. And has done mm. a tremendous amount. Um. To help me with to process my experience because I what mm. goes on in interrogation rooms um, was completely foreign to me. And he very much, um, after sort of hearing me out, what I 
what I experienced, shared his research with me, and I was just blown away. Um, mm. So anyway. Well, thanks for telling me about his work because I read some of his papers. Mm. Um, found really interesting this paper he wrote on the psychology of confessions. Does innocence put innocence at risk? Mm. He said, recent, recent research suggests that actual innocence does not protect people across a sequence of pivotal decisions. In pre-interrogation interviews, investigators commit false positive errors, presuming innocence, presuming innocent suspects guilty, naively believing in the transparency of their innocence Innocent suspects wave, wave their rights. This is hard to say because there's a lot of innocence and innocence. Despite or because of their denials, innocent suspects elicit highly confrontational interrogations. This looks like textbook Amanda Knox, right? Like, all you Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so grateful yeah. for his work. Well, tell me about your keynote uh, that you did at the American Psychology and Law Conference. Oh, um, I mean, I am interested in how the question of why these things happen. Um, and uh, mm. so when I'm invited to give a talk about this experience, I often will ask people like, well, what about like, what about this experience actually it interests you? And looking at this, I was really um, happy to go to the psychology and law conference because I, this is the part about wrongful convictions that I am most keen on. Like, hmm. why do, first of all, innocent people end up in this process? And, and how are, how are these institutions sort of built not to, not to like, I mean, Saul Kasson's research shows that there are lots of ways that innocent people are simply not accounted for, like in the interrogation room, where like, if you hmm. make if someone accuses you of something and you say, no, no, that's not that's not what I that's not what I did. Like the assumption is, oh, you're a guilty person who's lying and not that you're an actually innocent person. And so the ways that those coercive interrogation techniques, which are very, very effective at getting guilty people to confess to crimes, they're also very effective at getting innocent people to confess to crimes. But mm -hmm. beyond that, I'm also interested in not just the psychology of the innocent person, but the psychology of the prosecutor and the detective and why it is mm -hmm. that they end up honing in on the wrong person, not out of a sense of like, you know, outright evil or corruption, but out of a sense of like human fallacy. Because I, again, like when I think back to my prosecutor, I was never satisfied with the idea that, oh, this, this is happening to me just because bad people are doing bad things to me. Like, no, that's not what was happening. Mm -hmm. It was more complicated than that. And so I had to take into consideration, well, um, is there a kind of confirmation bias happening here? When the evidence finally came in that showed that it was Rudy Gaudet and not me, was there a conservatism bias where they had made mm. an already assumption about what the case was and they were only willing to tweak it just enough to accommodate a new set of information but not to contradict their previous theory of the case? Mm. Like there are so many ways that um, – you know, uh, even just the perception of me as a human being can be best explained, like this ongoing perception of me as like a guilty person is due to the anchoring bias. The fact that pe the first piece of information that people have ever heard about me was that I was a guilty of a terrible crime. And so even when new evidence has come forth revealing that not to be the case, people are biased towards the first thing that they ever heard. Um, and that mm. explains a lot of the why of my experience. It doesn't really explain how to get out of it, but um, at least <laughs> yeah. I have a better understanding of the human psychology yeah. behind yeah. my experience. Yeah. Like I said, it's like you got a PhD in psychology through this whole situation. Yeah. Um, you, so you're referring, your prosecutor, you're referring to Giuliano uh, Mignini. Yes. Yeah, Mignini. Giuliano Mignini. Come on, Scott. You used to sing Italian opera. You can do better than no, that. Giuliano Mignini. You, you yeah. actually did it really well. Most people are like, uh, okay. Giuliano. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if I sing it, if I sing it, it'll, I'll do a better job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, my my take of this this cat from watching the Netflix documentary mm -hmm. is that he sees himself as the modern day Sherlock Holmes. You know, he's like, you know, he just had built up in his mind, you know, this whole, like, I'm going to be the savior of the world. Like this is goes to your point you said earlier, you know, people that do um, bad things don't, 
think in their head, oh, I'm doing a bad thing. <laughs> they think mostly it's usually I'm doing something for the greater good. Mm-hmm. I, But there's a profound narcissism associated with a lot of those instances because you think in your head that you and only you are, are going to save the world. And that leads to hubris and that leads to overconfidence and that leads to subjectivity, Yes, which is what happened a lot up the kazoo yes. in your case, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But is there any chance for a reconciliation with him or... Well, that's an intriguing question because um, it is something that I have been um, contemplating and pursuing for a long time. I can't say much about it, but um, uh, just because it's an ongoing project. Um, But it is Mm. something that is deeply important to me, the idea that I can basically confront my accuser and um, do so in a way that would be not um, antagonistic, but um, re- uh, sort of restorative. Mm. Mm. Well, good. I really look forward to, to hearing something about that. Thanks. Yeah. And good for you for, I mean, I'd like to see you reckon, you talk to Rudy someday. Yeah. That would be incredible. That would also yeah. be a very interesting experience. Um and I'm not very um, emotional. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I, to say the least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not ready for that one. Yeah, I feel like I need a little more time for that one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We're not going to be like, oh, no, we're bringing out. Ruthie. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Itl drawer. Mm. Let's talk about Itl drawer. Love Itl drawer. Okay. Yes. I know, I know. And look, I want to thank you so much for bringing to my attention these amazing, amazing researchers, okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, because you got me down rabbit holes. I was like, oh, wow, the forensic science literature has some really serious problems. Yes, right. Has some really serious problems. Yeah. He said, I just want to quote something Etl said, which I completely agree with. He said, there isn't a psychologist on this planet. He's referring to cognitive science psychologist, which is what I am. Uh, There isn't a cognitive psychologist on this planet or any other planet who can come and say that judgment and perception are objective. It's one of the most basic cornerstones of psychology. Yet the more you start to look into the literature, you realize just how much, um, how many of these techniques, like even fingerprinting analysis, have never actually been scientifically validated. Mm -hmm. They've been used for over 100 years, right? Mm -hmm. So my gosh, like that's insane, right? Like that we assume that all these techniques are just completely objective and they don't involve bias. Um, when it turns out they very much do. And should we talk about one of the seminal studies that he conducted along those lines, where he showed that fingerprint analysts, when given anonymous prints from cases they themselves analyzed 10 years or so ago, they were asked to judge those same prints as a match or not. And when they were told that the suspect confessed, the results of their analysis often was in the opposite direction Mm -hmm. of what they themselves had said about those very prints when they first analyzed them. That's shocking. Yes. I I hope that everyone sort of like followed that. So like DNA or the fingerprint expert did a, did a study many years ago, determined, you know, match or not match. Then many, many years later was confronted with the very same prints and came up with a very different result based upon being told that the person had confessed to the crime. So I, uh, it's fa- like, and this is why Saul Kasson's work is so important, important because whether or not a person confesses is so, so biasing to people. People just mm-hmm. can't wrap their minds around an innocent person confessing to a crime. So they assume yeah. that that person now must be guilty. And even scientific experts are unable to to separate their now bias in their own, ob- you know, objective looks at physical evidence. And so that's why ETL Drawer proposes um, a solution, which is linear sequential screening or unmask, sorry, linear sequential unmasking, where you only tell the forensic experts as much information as they need to know in order to do their job. The uh, fingerprint expert doesn't need to know whether or not the suspect confessed or not in order to determine whether or not mm-hmm. a fingerprint is a match. So just don't give them that biasing information. It's that It's that simple. Yeah, I mean, studies show possible error rates of 1% to 4% in fingerprint analysis errors and 10% or more in paint fiber and body fluid analysis alone. Mm. Um, and then I just, the more I dig into this, the more I 
realize all the problems with this. So here, here this is a, one quote I came across. Um, you don't tell the crime lab scientists doing the DNA, for example, what the suspect's DNA profile looks like until they've extracted the DNA from the evidence profile for the victim first. I mean, it's like, duh, right? Yeah. <laughs> you hear that, you're like, of course. And um, yet, that's uh, not said, what the practice yeah, is. <laughs> yeah, it's not what the practice is. Yeah. Lentini said that. Lentini. This kind of methodology also helps eliminate unwitting or unconscious bias towards linking evidence to a suspect. So there's so many things that bring in subjectivity into this. And these are real lives that we're talking about yeah, and, that are being wrongfully convicted. And I think that yeah. it's important to note that, like, again, it's an unconscious bias that's impacting mm. these um, these experts and these detectives. Like, they're not knowingly and willingly making their lives easier and coming up with matches to the fingerprints because they heard someone confess. That just information unconsciously biased them to seeing results, objective results, very differently. And as a result, it, it is very, very important to um, not not like to acknowledge that that's just the case. Like it's not saying some kind of moral question about a forensic expert. It's just simply this is a human problem. This is not a you or me problem. It's a human problem. And yeah, there's um absolutely. actually are you familiar with um the psychopath test by John Ronson? I mean, I'm sure you are. Uh, well <laughs> so absolutely. So the uh yeah, so I the, one of the uh, co-authors of the psychopath test is one of my co-authors on our light triad paper. Oh, so great. Yay. He he came over he came over to the light side. <laughs> cool. Um yeah, yeah. yeah, but, yeah. I, one of my favorite jokes from that book um is John Ronson said, um as soon as I heard about confirmation bias, I started to see it everywhere. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, good. Yeah. It's also so it, true. It, it's so, it, <laughs> <laughs> it's so it is so so true and and motivated reasoning mm. you see motivated reasoning so much there's a, a whole line of research i'm writing an article right now for the atlantic about this on moral tribalism mm. and uh and group and group narcissism and the extent to which we overlook the moral transgressions of people we see in our in group mm -hmm. but if we have perceived them as being in our out group we will in ambiguous information we'll see moral transgressions absolutely so th this is this is this is very important stuff. Yeah. Very important stuff. Do you still write poetry? Is that do you is that still in you? Um. So I have um, the most recent poetry that I have out in the world is a book of poems um, called the Cardio Tesseract that me and my husband wrote together. Mm. It's actually a kind of collection of. He does poetry. Oh. Oh, Chris does poetry. Oh, he's, he, he's, way he's literally more. a writer. He, he's okay. yeah, lit yeah, like yeah. two master's gotcha. degrees in poetry kind of guy. Sorry, that was a stupid question. <laughs> like stupid question. in our okay. courtship, yeah. would be reciting poems to me. Like that's how it worked. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I just forgot. I just no, forgot. it's cool. Okay. It's cool. You didn't know. Why, why would you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. No. So we're we're big poetry nerds. He above all is a huge poetry nerd and is um, constantly finding wonderful opportunities to uh, share poetry with me and one of the, he's he's not much of a singer so with our daughter like i do a bunch of singing at her he recites her poetry <laughs> i love that yeah. i love that um as i told you earlier i'm really interested in this field of post traumatic growth mm. so i kind of want to leave with a question for you uh, rabbi harold kushner when he was reflecting on the death of his son, he said, quote, I am a more sensitive person, a more effective pastor, a more sympathetic counselor because of Aaron's life and death than I would ever have been without it. Mm. And I would give up all those gains in a second if I could have my son back. Mm. If I could choose, I would forego all the spiritual growth and depth which has come my way because of our experiences. But I cannot choose. So it, it, one can always think, you know, in sort of the uh, multiverse sort of uh Thought experiment: What would Amanda Knox look? What would it be to? Who would she be today if this experience didn't happen with her? But you can't choose that, no. and you'll never know. So moving forward, you know, what are some of the areas of growth that you're most excited about, and that you think genuinely came about that wouldn't have come about if this didn't happen to you? Um, that thank you for asking that. And I, gosh, yeah. I've that makes me so sad. Um, also because it's yeah. like I'm I'm a new I'm a new parent so I'm like newly appreciating mm. like the depths of that sadness. Um I'm really doing a great job making you cry today. <laughs> you are. You're just oh. like picking all the buttons. Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> um yeah, so I think that my greatest um I mean even just becoming more attuned to the suffering of others. Um, mm. is something that I don't know that I had a good grasp on 
um, before all of this, because honestly, like I, I before everything happened in Italy, I lived a very, very blessed life. I did not have difficulties. I, I my my family was very close and very supportive. Um, I had everything everything going for me, and mm. I don't think I really understood um, the depths of loss and despair that human beings are capable of and routinely experience. And so it gave me a lot of compassion for people who experience that and especially for people who experience that in a very public way and have that sort mm -hmm. of extra dimension of suffering put on them by people perceiving them as and and judging them while they are experiencing the worst experience of their lives. Um, so that yeah. that is something that I have a, 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 a new sort of ingrained radar for um, and perspective on that I have found to be not just useful for myself, but also useful for people who reach out to me and, and feel really alone yeah. and isolated. There's like a special... Yeah special suffering when it comes to people who are not only experiencing tragedy or loss or trauma, but are being judged very publicly in the process. So does this, no, that's actually a really good point. Does this experience make you a little bit more skeptical when some, some people are tried in the court of public opinion? Absolutely. So when everyone else is <laughs> jumping on someone, does it make you more sensitive? Yes, to, to 100%. Yeah. And I, and I hate mm. the idea like it really bugs me out the idea that some quality that about yourself that you cannot control s somehow mm -hmm. makes it so that you aren't suffering. Like, what are we talking about? Like, no, everyone who is being judged for some dramatic thing is suffering and period. So I don't know. It, also, when people say things like, oh, cancel culture isn't real, I'm like, no, it is like people are constantly trying to like sort of pin down people for like a one either real or imagined transgression and like define that person entirely by that thing and, and delete them, yeah. like literally cancel them. So I don't know. It's yeah. it's I, I feel like yeah. judgment in the public square is not treated with the amount of um weight that it actually carries on the person who experiences it. Um, pile on culture is really real and mob justice is often devoid of due process and proportional sentencing. And these are all reasons why we have a criminal justice system in the first place and don't just deal with transgressors out in the open. Like there is a reason for that. And um, so, yeah, I, I am a firm believer that we should have we should be way more cautious about um, the court of public opinion and have a lot more skepticism towards it. Yeah, I very much agree. Well, it looks to me like the gestalt uh, media narrative around you is changing. There seems to be something in the air, you know, the Rogan appearance, if, um, you know, the New York Times profile. Um, in our conversation today, my, my goal was quite simply for you to just show who you are. Just to show who you are. I didn't have to do anything. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. you are, you are who you are, and I wanted people to see that. Yeah. Um, Thanks. And um, and uh, well, thank you. You strike me as someone who's very, very deeply empathetic, and I would even say, um, an, a, a poetic soul. Aww. Like I feel like you have a poetic soul, Thanks. right? It, yeah. it, does that resonate with you? Yeah, totally. Yeah. It does. Um, I and I the way that I interpret that is, um, I feel like I see a lot of beauty even in the stuff that hurts, um, mm. which is what I feel like a poet is constantly doing, is finding the beauty in the pain um, and not, you know, reveling in it, but just like acknowledging it. I feel like acknowledging is a really important part of my life now. Yeah, so uh, Victor Frankl called that tragic optimism, mm. <laughs> is finding the, 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 be the beauty and meaning in tragedy. Mm. Um, thank you so much for, for coming to my podcast today, man. And I hope you feel like you were seen. I hope you feel seen. I totally today. feel seen today. Thank you very much. And you've given me a lot to think about, so I'll do okay. that. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you some follow-up nerdy papers and things <laughs> along the lines of what I talked about today. Cool. Thanks. All the best to you. All right. Take care. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.